Mr. Thompson said, Can I help you? I said, Do you know who killed Wellington? I did not look at his face. I do not like looking at people's faces, especially if they are strangers. He did not say anything for a few seconds. Then he said, Who are you? I said, I'm Christopher Boone from number 36 and I know you. You're Mr. Thompson. He said, I'm Mr. Thompson's brother. I said, Do you know who killed Wellington? He said, Who the fuck is Wellington? I said, Mrs. Shears's dog. Mrs. Shears is from number 41. He said, Someone killed her dog. I said, with a fork. He said, Jesus Christ. I said, a garden fork, in case he thought I meant a fork you eat your food with. Then I said, do you know who killed him? He said, I haven't a bloody clue. I said, did you see anything suspicious on Thursday evening? He said, look, son. Do you really think you should be going around asking questions like this? And I said, yes, because I want to find out who killed Wellington, and I am writing a book about it. And he said, well, I was in Colchester on Thursday, so you're asking the wrong bloke. I said, thank you, and I walked away. There was no answer at house number 42. I had seen the people who lived at number 44, but I did not know what their names were. They were black people and they were a man and a lady with two children, a boy and a girl. The lady answered the door. She was wearing boots which looked like army boots and there were five bracelets made out of a silver colored metal on her wrist and they made a jangling noise. She said, it's Christopher, isn't it? I said that it was, and I asked her if she knew who killed Wellington. She knew who. Wellington was so I didn't have to explain, and she had heard about him being killed. I asked if she had seen anything suspicious on Thursday evening which might be a clue. She said, like what? And I said, like strangers or like the sound of people arguing. But she said she hadn't. And then I decided to do what is called trying a different tack, and I asked her whether she knew of anyone who might want to make Mrs. Shear sad. And she said, perhaps you should be talking to your father about this. And I explained that I couldn't ask my father because the investigation was a secret because he had told me to stay out of other people's business. She said, well, maybe he has a point, Christopher. And I said, so, you don't know anything which might be a clue. And she said, no, and then she said, you be careful, young man. I said that I would be careful and then I said thank you to her for helping me with my questions and I went to number 43, which is the house next to Mrs. Shears's house. The people who live at number 43 are Mr. Wise and Mr. Wise's mother, who is in a wheelchair, which is why he lives with her, so he can take her to the shops and drive her around. It was Mr. Wise who answered the door. He smelled of body odor and old biscuits and off popcorn, which is what you smell of if you haven't washed for a very long time, like Jason at school smells because his family is poor. I asked Mr. Wise if he knew who had killed Wellington on Thursday night. He said, bloody hell, policemen really are getting younger, aren't they? Then he laughed. I do not like people laughing at me, so I turned and walked away. I did not knock at the door of number 38, which is the house next to our house, because the people there take drugs and father says that I should never talk to them, so I don't. 
And they play loud music at night and they make me scared sometimes when I see them in the street. And it is not really their house. Then I noticed that the old lady who lives at number 39, which is on the other side of Mrs. Shears's house, was in her front garden cutting her hedge with an electric hedge trimmer. Her name is Mrs. Alexander. She has a dog. It is a dachshund, so she was probably a good person because she liked dogs. But the dog wasn't in the garden with her. It was inside the house. Mrs. Alexander was wearing jeans and training shoes, which old people don't normally wear. And there was mud on the jeans. And the trainers were new balance trainers. And the laces were red. I went up to Mrs. Alexander and said, Do you know anything about Wellington being killed? Then she turned the electric hedge trimmer off and said, I'm afraid you're going to have to say that again. I'm a little deaf. So I said, Do you know anything about Wellington being killed? And she said, I heard about it yesterday. Dreadful. Dreadful. I said, Do you know who killed him? And she said, No, I don't. I replied, somebody must know because the person who killed Wellington knows that they killed Wellington, unless they were a mad person and didn't know what they were doing, or unless they had amnesia. And she said, well, I suppose you're probably right. I said, thank you for helping me with my investigation. And she said, you're Christopher, aren't you? I said, yes. I live at number 36. And she said, we haven't talked before, have we? I said, no. I don't like talking to strangers. But I'm doing detective work. And she said, I see you every day, going to school. I didn't reply to this. And she said, it's very nice of you to come and say hello. I didn't reply to this either because Mrs. Alexander was doing what is called chatting, where people say things to each other which aren't questions and answers and aren't connected. Then she said, even if it's only because you're doing detective work. And I said, thank you again. And I was about to turn and walk away when she said, I have a grandson your age. I tried to do chatting by saying, my age is 15 years and 3 months and 3 days. And she said, well, almost your age. Then we said nothing for a little while until she said, you don't have a dog, do you? And I said, no. She said, you'd probably like a dog, wouldn't you? And I said, I have a rat. And she said, a rat? And I said, he's called Toby. And she said, oh. And I said, most people don't like rats because they think they carry diseases like bubonic. Plague. But that's only because they lived in sewers and stowed away on ships coming from foreign. Countries where there were strange diseases. But rats are very clean. Toby is always washing himself. And you don't have to take him out for walks. I just let him run around my room so that he gets some exercise. And sometimes he sits on my shoulder or hides in my sleeve like it's a burrow. But rats don't live in burrows in nature. Mrs. Alexander said, Do you want to come in for tea? And I said, I don't go into other people's houses. And she said, well, maybe I could bring some out here. Do you like lemon squash? I replied, I only like orange squash. And she said, luckily I have some of that as well. And what about Battenberg? And I said, I don't know because I don't know what Battenberg is. She said, it's a kind of cake. 
It has four pink and yellow squares in the middle and it has marzipan icing round the edge. And I said, is it a long cake with a square cross section which is divided into equally sized, alternately colored squares? And she said, yes, I think you could probably describe it like that. I said, I think I'd like the pink squares but not the yellow squares because I don't like yellow. And I don't know what marzipan is, so I don't know whether I'd like that. And she said, I'm afraid marzipan is yellow, too. Perhaps I should bring out some biscuits. Instead, do you like biscuits? And I said, yes. Some sorts of biscuits. And she said, I'll get a selection. Then she turned and went into the house. She moved very slowly because she was an old lady. And she was inside the house for more than six minutes and I began to get nervous because I didn't know what she was doing in the house. I didn't know her well enough to know whether she was telling the truth about getting orange squash and Battenberg cake. And I thought she might be ringing the police and then I'd get into much more serious trouble because of the caution. So I walked away. And as I was crossing the street I had a stroke of inspiration about who might have killed Wellington. I was imagining a chain of reasoning inside my head which was like this. 1. Why would you kill a dog? A. Because you hated the dog. B. Because you were mad. C. Because you wanted to make Mrs. Shears upset. 2. I didn't know anyone who hated Wellington, so if it was a it was probably a stranger. 3. I didn't know any mad people, so if it was B it was also probably a stranger. 4. Most murders are committed by someone who is known to the victim. In fact, you are most likely to be murdered by a member of your own family on Christmas Day. This is a fact. Wellington was therefore most likely to have been killed by someone known to him. 5. If it was C, I only knew one person who didn't like Mrs. Shears, and that was Mr. Shears, who knew Wellington very well indeed. This meant that Mr. Shears was my prime suspect. Mr. Shears used to be married to Mrs. Shears and they lived together until two years ago. Then Mr. Shears left and didn't come back. This was why Mrs. Shears came over and did lots of cooking for us after Mother died because she didn't have to cook for Mr. Shears anymore and she didn't have to stay at home and be his wife. And also father said that she needed company and didn't want to be on her own. And sometimes Mrs. Shears stayed overnight at our house and I liked it when she did because she made things tidy and she arranged the jars and pans and tins in order of their height on the shelves in the kitchen and she always made their labels face outward, and she put the knives and forks and spoons in the correct compartments in the cutlery drawer. But she smoked cigarettes and she said lots of things I didn't understand, example, I'm going to hit the hay, and it's brass monkeys out there, and let's rustle up some tucker. And I didn't like when she said things like that because I didn't know what she meant. And I don't know why Mr. Shears left Mrs. Shears because nobody told me. But when you get married it is because you want to live together and have children, and if you get married in a church you have to promise that you will stay together until death do us part. And if you don't want to live together you have to get divorced and this is because one of you has done sex with somebody else or because you are having arguments and you hate each other and you don't want to live in the same house anymore and have children. 
And Mr. Shears didn't want to live in the same house as Mrs. Shears anymore so he probably hated her and he might have come back and killed her dog to make her sad. I decided to try and find out more about Mr. Shears. All the other children at my school are stupid. Except I'm not meant to call them stupid, even though this is what they are. I'm meant to say that they have learning difficulties or that they have special needs. But this is stupid because everyone has learning difficulties because learning to speak French or understanding relativity is difficult and also everyone has special needs, like father, who has to carry a little packet of artificial sweetening tablets around with him to put in his coffee to stop him from getting fat, or Mrs. Peters, who wears a beige-colored hearing aid, or Siobhan, who has glasses so thick that they give you a headache if you borrow them, and none of these people are special needs, even if they have special needs. But Siobhan said we have to use those words because people used to call children like the children at school spaz and crip and mong, which were nasty words. But that is stupid too because sometimes the children from the school down the road see us in the street when we're getting off the bus and they shout, special needs. Special needs. But I don't take any notice because I don't listen to what other people say and only sticks and stones can break my bones and I have my Swiss. Army knife if they hit me and if I kill them it will be self-defense and I won't go to prison. I am going to prove that I'm not stupid. Next month I'm going to take my A level in maths and I'm going to get an A grade. No one has ever taken an A level at our school before and the headmistress, Mrs. Gascoigne, didn't want me to take it at first. She said they didn't have the facilities to let us sit a levels. But father had an argument with Mrs. Gascoigne and he got really cross. Mrs. Gascoigne said they didn't want to treat me differently from everyone else in the school because then everyone would want to be treated differently and it would set a precedent. And I could always do my levels later, at 18. I was sitting in Mrs. Gascoigne's office with father when she said these things. And father said, Christopher is getting a crap enough deal already, don't you think, without you shitting on him from a great height as well. Jesus, this is the one thing he is really good at. Then Mrs. Gascoigne said that she and father should talk about this at some later point on their own. But father asked her whether she wanted to say things she was embarrassed to say in front of me, and she said no, so he said, say them now, then. And she said that if I sat an A level I would have to have a member of staff looking after me on my own in a separate room. And father said he would pay someone 50 pounds to do it after school and he wasn't going to take no for an answer. And she said she'd go away and think about it. And the next week she rang father at home and told him that I could take the A level and the Reverend Peters would be what is called the invigilator. And after I've taken A level maths I am going to take A level further maths and physics and then I can go to university. There is not a university in our town, which is Swindon, because it is a small place. So we will have to move to another town where there is a university because I don't want to live on my own or in a house with other students. But that will be alright because father wants to move to a different town as well. He sometimes say things like, we've got to get out of this town, kiddo. And sometimes he says, Swindon is the arsehole of the world. Then, when I've got a degree in maths, or physics, or maths and physics, I will be able to get a job and earn lots of money and I will be able to pay someone who can look after me and cook my meals and wash my clothes, 
or I will get a lady to marry me and be my wife and she can look after me so I can have company and not be on my own. I used to think that mother and father might get divorced. That was because they had lots of arguments and sometimes they hated each other. This was because of the stress of looking after someone who has behavioral problems like I have. I used to have lots of behavioral problems, but I don't have so many now because I'm more grown up and I can take decisions for myself and do things on my own like going out of the house and buying things at the shop at the end of the road. These are some of my behavioral problems. Not talking to people for a long time. Not eating or drinking anything for a long time. Not liking being touched. Screaming when I am angry or confused. Not liking being in really small places with other people. Smashing things when I am angry or confused groaning. Not liking yellow things or brown things and refusing to touch yellow things or brown things. Refusing to use my toothbrush if anyone else has touched it. Not eating food if different sorts of food are touching each other. Not noticing that people are angry with me. Not smiling. Saying things that other people think are rude. Doing stupid things. Hitting other people. Ating France. Driving mother's car. Sometimes these things would make mother and father really angry and they would shout at me or they would shout at each other. Sometimes father would say, Christopher, if you do not behave I swear I shall knock the living daylights out of you. Or mother would say, Jesus, Christopher, I am seriously considering putting you in a home, or mother would say, you are going to drive me into an early grave. When I got home father was sitting at the table in the kitchen and he had made my supper. He was wearing a lumberjack shirt. The supper was baked beans and broccoli and two slices of ham and they were laid out on the plate so that they were not touching. He said, where have you been? And I said, I have been out. This is called a white lie. A white lie is not a lie at all. It is where you tell the truth but you do not tell all of the truth. This means that everything you say is a white lie because when someone says, for example, what do you want to do today, you say, I want to do painting with Mrs. Peters, but you don't say, I want to have my lunch and I want to go to the toilet and I want to go home after school and I want to play with Toby and I want to have my supper and I want to play on my computer and I want to go to bed. And I said a white lie because I knew that father didn't want me to be a detective. Father said, I have just had a phone call from Mrs. Shears. I started eating my baked beans and broccoli and two slices of ham. Then father asked, what the hell were you doing poking round her garden? I said, I was doing detective work trying to find out who killed Wellington. Father replied, how many times do I have to tell you, Christopher? The baked beans and the broccoli and the ham were cold but I didn't mind this. I eat very slowly so my food is nearly always cold. Father said, I told you to keep your nose out of other people's business. I said, I think Mr. Shears probably killed Wellington. Father didn't say anything. I said, he is my prime suspect. Because I think someone might have killed Wellington to make Mrs. Shears sad. And a murder is usually committed by someone known. Father banged the table with his fist really hard so that the plates and his knife and fork jumped around and my ham jumped sideways so that it touched the broccoli, so I couldn't eat the ham or the broccoli anymore. Then he shouted, I will not have that man's name mentioned in my house. I asked, why not? 
And he said, That man is evil. And I said, Does that mean he might have killed Wellington? Father put his head in his hands and said, Jesus wept. I could see that father was angry with me, so I said, I know you told me not to get involved in other people's business but Mrs. Shears is a friend of ours. And father said, well, she's not a friend anymore. And I asked, why not? And father said, okay, Christopher, I am going to say this for the last and final time. I will not tell you again. Look at me when I'm talking to you, for God's sake. Look at me. You are not to go asking Mrs. Shears about who killed that bloody dog. You are not to go asking anyone about who killed that bloody dog. You are not to go trespassing in other people's gardens. You are to stop this. Ridiculous bloody detective game right now. I didn't say anything. Father said, I am going to make you promise, Christopher. And you know what it means when I make you promise. I didn't know what it meant when you say you promise something. You have to say that you will never do something again and then you must never do it because that would make the promise a lie. I said, I know. Father said, promise me you will stop doing these things. Promise that you will give up this ridiculous game right now, okay? I said, I promise. I think I would make a very good astronaut. To be a good astronaut you have to be intelligent and I'm intelligent. You also have to understand how machines work and I'm good at understanding how machines work. You also have to be someone who would like being on their own in a tiny spacecraft thousands and thousands of miles away from the surface of the earth and not panic or get claustrophobia or homesick or insane. And I like really little spaces, so long as there is no one else in them with me. Sometimes when I want to be on my own I get into the airing cupboard outside the bathroom and slide in beside the boiler and pull the door closed behind me and sit there and think for hours and it makes me feel very calm. So I would have to be an astronaut on my own or have my own part of the spacecraft which no one else could come into. And also there are no yellow things or brown things in a spacecraft, so that would be okay, too. And I would have to talk to other people from mission control, but we would do that through a radio link up and a TV monitor, so they wouldn't be like real people who are strangers, but it would be like playing a computer game. Also I wouldn't be homesick at all because I'd be surrounded by lots of the things I like, which are machines and computers and outer space. And I would be able to look out of a little window in the spacecraft and know that there was no one else near me for thousands and thousands of miles, which is what I sometimes pretend at night in the summer, when I go and lie on the lawn, and look up at the sky and I put my hands round the sides of my face so that I can't see the fence and the chimney and the washing line and I can pretend I'm in space and all I could see would be stars and stars are the places where the molecules that life is made of were constructed billions of years ago for example all the iron in your blood which stops you from being anemic was made in a star. And I would like it if I could take Toby with me into space, and that might be allowed because they sometimes do take animals into space for experiments, so if I could think of a good experiment you could do with a rat that didn't hurt the rat, I could make them let me take Toby. But if they didn't let me I would still go because it would be a dream come true. The next day at school I told Siobhan that father had told me I couldn't do any more detecting, which meant that the book was finished. 
I showed her the pages I had written so far, with the diagram of the universe and the map of the street and the prime numbers. And she said that it didn't matter. She said the book was really good as it was and that I should be very proud of having written a book at all, even if it was quite short and there were some very good books which were very short like Heart of Darkness, which was by Conrad. But I said that it wasn't a proper book because it didn't have a proper ending because I never found out who killed Wellington so the murderer was still at large. And she said that was like life, and not all murders were solved and not all murderers were caught. Like Jack the Ripper. I said I didn't like the idea that the murderer was still at large. I said I didn't like to think that the person who killed Wellington could be living somewhere nearby and I might meet him when I went out for a walk at night. And this was possible because a murder was usually committed by a person who was known to the victim. Then I said, Father said I was never to mention Mr. Shears's name in our house again and that he was an evil man and maybe that meant he was the person who killed Wellington. And she said, perhaps your father just doesn't like Mr. Shears very much. And I asked, why? And she said, I don't know, Christopher. I don't know because I don't know anything about Mr. Shears. I said, Mr. Shears used to be married to Mrs. Shears and he left her, like in a divorce. But I don't know if they were actually divorced. And Siobhan said, well, Mrs. Shears is a friend of yours, isn't she? A friend of you and your father. So perhaps your father doesn't like Mr. Shears because he left Mrs. Shears. Because he did something bad to someone who is a friend. And I said, but father says Mrs. Shears isn't a friend of ours anymore. And Siobhan said, I'm sorry, Christopher. I wish I could answer all these questions, but I simply don't know. Then the bell went for the end of school. The next day I saw four yellow cars in a row on the way to school, which made it a black day, so I didn't eat anything at lunch and I sat in the corner of the room all day and read my A-level maths course book. And the next day, too, I saw four yellow cars in a row on the way to school, which made it another black day too, so I didn't speak to anyone and for the whole afternoon I sat in the corner of the library groaning with my head pressed into the join between the two walls and this made me feel calm and safe. But on the third day I kept my eyes closed all the way to school until we got off the bus because after I have had two black days in a row I'm allowed to do that. But it wasn't the end of the book because five days later I saw five red cars in a row, which made it a super good day, and I knew that something special was going to happen. Nothing special happened at school so I knew something special was going to happen after school. And when I got home I went down to the shop at the end of our road to buy some licorice laces and a milky bar with my pocket money. And when I had bought my licorice laces and a milky bar I turned round and saw Mrs. Alexander, the old lady from number 39, who was in the shop as well. She wasn't wearing jeans now. She was wearing a dress like a normal old lady. And she smelled of cooking. She said, what happened to you the other day? I asked, which day? And she said, I came out again and you'd gone. I had to eat all the biscuits myself. I said, I went away. And she said, I gathered that. I said, I thought you might ring the police. And she said, why on earth would I do that? And I said, because I was poking my nose into other people's business and father said I shouldn't investigate who killed Wellington. 
And a policeman gave me a caution and if I get into trouble again it will be a lot worse because of the caution. Then the Indian lady behind the counter said to Mrs. Alexander, can I help you? And Mrs. Alexander said she'd like a pint of milk and a packet of Jaffa cakes and I went out of the shop. When I was outside the shop I saw that Mrs. Alexander's dachshund was sitting on the pavement. It was wearing a little coat made out of tartan material, which is Scottish and Czech. She had tied its lead to the drain pipe next to the door. I like dogs, so I bent down and I said hello to her dog and it licked my hand. Its tongue was rough and wet and it liked the smell on my trousers and started sniffing them. Then Mrs. Alexander came outside and said, his name is Ivor. I didn't say anything. And Mrs. Alexander said, you're very shy, aren't you, Christopher? And I said, I'm not allowed to talk to you. And she said, don't worry. I'm not going to tell the police and I'm not going to tell your father, because there's nothing wrong with having a chat. Having a chat is just being friendly, isn't it? I said, I can't do chatting. Then she said, do you like computers? And I said, yes. I like computers. I have a computer at home in my bedroom. And she said, I know. I can see you sitting at your computer in your bedroom sometimes when I look across the street. Then she untied Ivor's lead from the drain pipe. I wasn't going to say anything because I didn't want to get into trouble. Then I thought that this was a super good day and something special hadn't happened yet, so it was possible that talking to Mrs. Alexander was the special thing that was going to happen. And I thought that she might tell me something about Wellington or about Mr. Shears without me asking her, so that wouldn't be breaking my promise. So I said, and I like maths and looking after Toby. And also I like outer space and I like being on my own. And she said, I bet you're very good at maths, aren't you? And I said, I am. I'm going to do my A-level maths next month. And I'm going to get an A grade. And Mrs. Alexander said, really? A-level maths? I replied, yes. I don't tell lies. And she said, I apologize. I didn't mean to suggest that you were lying. I just wondered if I heard you correctly. I'm a little deaf sometimes. And I said, I remember. You told me. And then I said, I'm the first person to do an A-level from my school because it's a special school. And she said, well, I am very impressed. And I hope you do get an A. And I said, I will. Then she said, and the other thing I know about you is that your favorite color is not yellow. And I said, no. And it's not brown either. My favorite color is red. And metal color. Then Ivor did a poo and Mrs. Alexander picked it up with her hand inside a little plastic bag and then she turned the plastic bag inside out and tied a knot in the top so that the poo was all sealed up and she didn't touch the poo with her hands. And then I did some reasoning. I reasoned that father had only made me do a promise about five things, which were not to mention Mr. Shears's name in our house. Not to go asking Mrs. Shears about who killed that bloody dog. Not to go asking anyone about who killed that bloody dog. Not to go trespassing in other people's gardens. To stop this ridiculous bloody detective game. And asking about Mr. Shears wasn't any of these things. And if you are a detective you have to take risks, and this was a super good day, which meant it was a good day for taking risks, so I said, do you know Mr. Shears, which was like chatting.
And Mrs. Alexander said, not really, no. I mean, I knew him well enough to say hello and talk to a little in the street, but I didn't know much about him. I think he worked in a bank. The National Westminster. In town. And I said, father says that he is an evil man. Do you know why he said that? Is Mr. Shears an evil man? And Mrs. Alexander said, Why are you asking me about Mr. Shears, Christopher? I didn't say anything because I didn't want to be investigating Wellington's murder and that was the reason I was asking about Mr. Shears. But Mrs. Alexander said, Is this about Wellington? And I nodded because that didn't count as being a detective. Mrs. Alexander didn't say anything. She walked to the little red box on a pole next to the gate to the park and she put Ivor's poo into the box, which was a brown thing inside a red thing, which made my head feel funny so I didn't look. Then she walked back to me. She sucked in a big breath and said, Perhaps it would be best not to talk about these things, Christopher. And I asked, why not? And she said, because. Then she stopped and decided to start saying a different sentence. Because maybe your father is right and you shouldn't go around asking questions about this. And I asked, why? And she said, because obviously he is going to find it quite upsetting. And I said, why is he going to find it upsetting? Then she sucked in another big breath and said, because, because I think you know why your father doesn't like Mr. Shears very much. Then I asked, did Mr. Shears kill mother? And Mrs. Alexander said, kill her? And I said, yes. Did he kill mother? And Mrs. Alexander said, no. No. Of course he didn't kill your mother. And I said, but did he give her stress so that she died of a heart attack? And Mrs. Alexander said, I honestly don't know what you're talking about, Christopher. And I said, or did he hurt her so that she had to go into hospital? And Mrs. Alexander said, did she have to go into hospital? And I said, yes. And it wasn't very serious at first, but she had a heart attack when she was in hospital. And Mrs. Alexander said, oh my goodness. I said, and she died. And Mrs. Alexander said, oh my goodness again, and then she said, oh, Christopher, I am so, so sorry. I never realized. Then I asked her, why did you say, I think you know why your father doesn't like Mr. Shears very much? Mrs. Alexander put her hand over her mouth and said, oh dear, dear, dear. But she didn't answer my question. So I asked her the same question again, because in a murder mystery novel when someone doesn't want to answer a question it is because they are trying to keep a secret or trying to stop someone from getting into trouble, which means that the answers to those questions are the most important answers of all, and that is why the detective has to put that person under pressure. But Mrs. Alexander still didn't answer. Instead she asked me a question. She said, so you don't know? And I said, don't know what? She replied, Christopher, look, I probably shouldn't be telling you this. Then she said, perhaps we should take a little walk in the park together. This is not the place to be talking about this kind of thing. I was nervous. I did not know Mrs. Alexander. I knew that she was an old lady and that she liked dogs. But she was a stranger. And I never go into the park on my own because it is dangerous and people inject drugs behind the public toilets in the corner. 
I wanted to go home and go up to my room and feed Toby and practice some maths. But I was excited, too. Because I thought she might tell me a secret. And the secret might be about who killed Wellington. Or about Mr. Shears. And if she did that I might have more evidence against him, or be able to exclude him from my investigations. So because it was a super good day I decided to walk into the park with Mrs. Alexander, even though it scared me. When we were inside the park Mrs. Alexander stopped walking and said, I am going to say something to you and you must promise not to tell your father that I told you this. I asked, why? And she said, I shouldn't have said what I said. And if I don't explain, you'll carry on wondering what I meant. And you might ask your father. And I don't want you to do that because I don't want you to upset him. So I'm going to explain why I said what I said. But before I do that you have to promise not to tell anyone I said this to you. I asked, why? And she said, Christopher, please, just trust me. And I said, I promise. Because if Mrs. Alexander told me who killed Wellington, or she told me that Mr. Shears had really killed Mother, I could still go to the police and tell them because you are allowed to break a promise if someone has committed a crime and you know about it. And Mrs. Alexander said, Your mother, before she died, was very good friends with Mr. Shears. And I said, I know. And she said, no, Christopher. I'm not sure that you do. I mean that they were very good friends. Very, very good friends. I thought about this for a while and said, do you mean that they were doing sex? And Mrs. Alexander said, yes, Christopher. That is what I mean. Then she didn't say anything for about 30 seconds. Then she said, I'm sorry, Christopher. I really didn't mean to say anything that was going to upset you. But I wanted to explain. Why I said what I said. You see, I thought you knew. That's why your father thinks that Mr. Shears is an evil man. And that will be why he doesn't want you going around talking to people about Mr. Shears. Because that will bring back bad memories. And I said, was that why Mr. Shears left Mrs. Shears, because he was doing sex with someone else when he was married to Mrs. Shears? And Mrs. Alexander said, yes, I expect so. Then she said, I'm sorry, Christopher. I really am. And I said, I think I should go now. And she said, are you okay, Christopher? And I said, I'm scared of being in the park with you because you're a stranger. And she said, I'm not a stranger, Christopher, I'm a friend. And I said, I'm going to go home now. And she said, if you want to talk about this you can come and see me anytime you want. You only have to knock on my door. And I said, okay. And she said, Christopher? And I said, what? And she said, you won't tell your father about this conversation, will you? And I said, no. I promised. And she said, you go on home. And remember what I said. Anytime. Then I went home. Mr. Javant said that I liked maths because it was safe. He said I liked maths because it meant solving problems, and these problems were difficult and interesting but there was always a straightforward answer at the end. And what he meant was that maths wasn't like life because in life there are no straightforward answers at the end. I know he meant this because this is what he said. This is because Mr. Javance doesn't understand numbers. 
Here is a famous story called the Monty Hall problem which I have included in this book because it illustrates what I mean. There used to be a column called Ask Marilyn in a magazine called Parade in America. And this column was written by Marilyn Vossavant and in the magazine it said that she had the highest IQ in the world in the Guinness Book of World Records Hall of Fame. And in the column she answered maths questions sent in by readers. And in September 1990 this question was sent in by Craig F. Whitaker of Columbia, Maryland, but it is not what is called a direct quote because I have made it simpler and easier to understand. You are on a game show on television. On this game show the idea is to win a car. As a prize. The game show host shows you three doors. He says that there is a car behind one of the doors and there are goats behind the other two doors. He asks you to pick a door. You pick a door but the door is not opened. Then the game show host opens one of the doors you didn't pick to show a goat because he knows what is behind the doors. Then he says that you have one final chance to change your mind before the doors are opened and you get a car or a goat. So he asks you if you want to change your mind and pick the other unopened door instead. What should you do? Marilyn Vosavant said that you should always change and pick the final door because the chances are two in three that there will be a car behind that door. But if you use your intuition you think that chance is 50 to 50 because you think there is an equal chance that the car is behind any door. Lots of people wrote to the magazine to say that Marilyn Vosavant was wrong, even when she explained very carefully why she was right. Of the letters she got about the problem, 92% said that she was wrong and lots of these were from mathematicians and scientists. Here are some of the things that they said.